Chapters five and six of Foul Play by Charles Reed and Dion Boucicault. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Five. The moon went down, the stars shone out clearer. Eleven o'clock boomed from a church clock in the town. Wardlaw did not come, and Seaton did not move from his ambush twelve o'clock boomed and wardlaw never came and seaton never moved soon after midnight general rolleston's hall door opened and a figure appeared in a flood of light seaton's eye gleamed at the light for it was young wardlaw with a footman at his back holding a lighted lamp wardlaw however seemed in no hurry to leave the house and the reason soon appeared he was joined by helen rolleston and she was equipped for walking the watcher saw her serene face shine in the light the general himself came next and as they left the door out came tom with a blunderbuss and brought up the rear seaton drew behind the trees and postponed but did not resign his purpose steps and murmurings came and passed him and receded the only words he caught distinctly came from wardlaw as he passed it is nearly high tide i fear we must make haste seaton followed the whole party at a short distance feeling sure they would eventually separate and give him his opportunity with wardlaw they went down to the harbour and took a boat seaton came nearer and learned they were going on board the great steamer bound for england that loomed so black with monstrous eyes of fire they put off and seaton stood baffled presently the black monster with enormous eyes of fire spouted her steam like a leviathan and then was still next the smoke puffed the heavy paddles revolved and she rushed out of the harbour and seaton sat down upon the ground and all seemed ended helen gone to england wardlaw gone with her love and revenge had alike eluded him he looked up at the sky and played with the pebbles at his feet stupidly stupidly he wondered why he was born why he consented to live a single minute after this his angel and his demon gone home together and he left here he wrote a few lines on the paper he had intended for wardlaw sprinkled them with sand and put them in his bosom then stretched himself out with a weary moan like a dying dog to wait the flow of the tide and with it death whether or not his resolution or his madness could have carried him so far cannot be known for even as the water rippled in and trickling under his back chilled him to the bone a silvery sound struck his ear he started to his feet and life and its joys rushed back upon him it was the voice of the woman he loved so madly helen rolleston was on the water coming ashore again in the little boat he crawled like a lizard among the boats ashore to catch a sight of her he did see her was near her unseen himself she landed with her father so wardlaw was gone to england without her seaton trembled with joy presently his goddess began to lament in the prettiest way papa she sighed why must france part in this sad world poor arthur is gone from me and by and by i shall go from you my own papa and at that prospect she wept gently why you foolish child said the old general tenderly what matters a little parting when we are all to meet again in dear old england well then there have a cry it will do you good he patted her head tenderly as she clung to his warlike breast and she took him at his word the tears ran swiftly and glistened in the fairy starlight but oh how seaton's heart yearned at all this what mustn't he say a word to comfort her he who at that moment would have thought no more of dying to serve her or to please her than he would of throwing one of those pebbles into that slimy water well her pure tears somehow cooled his hot brain and washed his soul and left him wondering at himself and his misdeeds this night his guardian angel seemed to go by and wave her dewy wings and fan his hot passions as she passed he kneeled down and thanked god he had not met arthur wardlaw in that dark lane then he went home to his humble lodgings and there buried himself and from that day seldom went out except to seek employment he soon obtained it as a copyist 
meantime the police were on his track employed by a person with a gentle disposition but a tenacity of purpose truly remarkable great was seaton's uneasiness when one day he saw hexam at the foot of his stair greater still when the officer's quick eye caught sight of him and his light foot ascended the stairs directly he felt sure hexam had heard of his lurking about general rolleston's premises however he prepared to defend himself to the uttermost hexam came into his room without ceremony and looking mighty grim well my lad so we have got you after all what is my crime now asked seaton sullenly james said the officer very solemnly it is an unheard-of crime this time you have been running away from a pretty girl now that is a mistake at all times but when she is as beautiful as an angel and rich enough to slip a flyer into dick hexam's hands and lay him on your track what is the use letter for you my man seaton took the letter with a puzzled air it was written in a clear but feminine hand and slightly scented the writer in a few polished lines excused herself for taking extraordinary means to find mr seaton but hoped he would consider that he had laid her under a deep obligation and that gratitude will sometimes be importunate she had the pleasure to inform him that the office of shipping clerk at messrs white and company was at his service and she hoped he would take it without an hour's further delay for that she was assured that many persons had risen to wealth and consideration in the colony from such situations then as this wary but courteous young lady had no wish to enter into a correspondence with her ex-gardener she added mr seaton need not trouble himself to reply to this note a simple yes to mr hexam will be enough and will give sincere pleasure to mr seaton's obedient servant and well-wisher helen ann rolleston seaton bowed his head over this letter in silent but deep emotion hexam respected that emotion and watched him with a sort of vague sympathy seaton lifted his head and the tears stood thick in his eyes said he in a voice of exquisite softness scarce above a whisper tell her yes and god bless her good-bye i want to go on my knees and pray god to bless her as she deserves good-bye hexam took the hint and retired softly six white and company stumbled on a treasure in james seaton your colonial clerk is not so narrow and apathetic as your london clerk whose two objects seem to be to learn one department only and not to do too much in that but seaton a gentleman and a scholar eclipsed even colonial clerks in this that he omitted no opportunity of learning the whole business of white and company and was also animated by a feverish zeal that now and then provoked laughter from clerks but was agreeable as well as surprising to white and company of that zeal his incurable passion was partly the cause fortunes had been made with great rapidity in sydney and seaton now conceived a wild hope of acquiring one by some lucky hit before wardlaw could return to helen rolleston and yet his common sense said if i was as rich as croesus how could she ever mate with me a stained man and yet his burning heart said don't listen to reason listen only to me try and so he worked double tides and in virtue of his university education had no snobbish notions about never putting his hand to manual labour he would lay down his pen at any moment and bear a hand to lift a chest or roll a cask old white saw him thus multiply himself and was so pleased that he raised his salary one-third he never saw helen rolleston except on sunday on that day he went to her church and sat half behind a pillar and feasted his eyes and his heart upon her he lived sparingly saved money bought a strip of land by payment of ten pounds deposit and sold it in forty hours for one hundred pounds profit and watched keenly for similar opportunities on a larger scale and all for her struggling with a mountain hoping against reason and the world white and company were employed to ship a valuable cargo on board two vessels chartered by wardlaw and son the shannon and proserpine both these ships lay in sydney harbour and had taken in the bulk of their cargoes but the supplement was the cream for wardlaw in person had warehoused eighteen cases of gold dust and ingots and fifty of lead and smelted copper 
they were all examined and branded by mr white who had duplicate keys of the gold cases but the contents as a matter of habit and prudence were not described outside but were marked proserpine and shannon respectively the mate of the proserpine who was in wardlaw's confidence had written instructions to look carefully to the stowage of all these cases and was in and out of the store one afternoon just before closing and measured the cubic contents of the cases with a view to stowage in the respective vessels the last time he came he seemed rather the worse for liquor and seaton who accompanied him having stepped out for a moment for something or other was rather surprised on his return to find the door closed and it struck him mr wylie that was the mate's name might be inside the more so as the door closed very easily with a spring bolt but it could only be opened by a key of peculiar construction seaton took out his key opened the door and called to the mate but received no reply however he took the precaution to go round the store and see whether wylie rendered somnolent by liquor might not be lying oblivious among the cases wylie however was not to be seen and seaton finding himself alone did an unwise thing he came and contemplated wardlaw's cases of metal and specie men will go too near the thing that causes their pain he eyed them with grief and with desire and could not restrain a sigh at these material proofs of his rival's wealth the wealth that probably had smoothed his way to general rolleston's home and to his daughter's heart for wealth can pave the way to hearts ay even to hearts that cannot be downright bought this reverie no doubt lasted longer than he thought for presently he heard the loud rattle of shutters going up below it was closing time he hastily closed and locked the iron shutters and then went out and shut the door he had been gone about two hours and that part of the street so noisy in business hours was hushed in silence all but an occasional footstep on the flags outside when something mysterious occurred in the warehouse now as dark as pitch at an angle of the wall stood two large cases in a vertical position with smaller cases lying at their feet these two cases were about eight feet high more or less well behind these cases suddenly flashed a feeble light and the next moment two brown and sinewy hands appeared on the edge of one of the cases the edge next the wall the case vibrated and rocked a little and the next moment there mounted on the top of it not a cat nor a monkey as might have been expected but an animal that in truth resembles both these quadrupeds viz a sailor and need we say that sailor was the mate of the proserpine he descended lightly from the top of the case behind which he had been jammed for hours and lighted a dark lantern and went softly groping about the store with it this was a mysterious act and would perhaps have puzzled the proprietors of the store even more than it would a stranger for a stranger would have said at once this is burglary or else arson but those acquainted with the place would have known that neither of those crimes was very practicable this enterprising sailor could not burn down this particular store without roasting himself the first thing and indeed he could not burn it down at all for the roof was flat and was in fact one gigantic iron tank like the roof of mr goading's brewery in london and by a neat contrivance of american origin the whole tank could be turned in one moment to a shower bath and drown a conflagration in thirty seconds or thereabouts nor could he rifle the place the goods were greatly protected by their weight and it was impossible to get out of the store without raising an alarm and being searched but not to fall into the error of writers who underrate their readers curiosity and intelligence and so deluge them with comments and explanations we will now simply relate what wylie did leaving you to glean his motives as this tale advances his jacket had large pockets and he took out of them a bunch of eighteen bright steel keys numbered a set of new screwdrivers a flask of rum and two ship biscuits he unlocked the eighteen cases marked proserpine etc and peering in with his lantern saw the gold dust and small ingots packed in parcels and surrounded by australian wool of the highest possible quality it was a luscious sight he then proceeded to a heavier task he unscrewed one after another eighteen of the cases marked shannon and the eighteen so selected perhaps by private marks proved to be packed close and on a different system from the gold viz 
in pigs or square blocks three or in some cases four to each chest now these two ways of packing the specie and the baser metal respectively had the effect of producing a certain uniformity of weight in the thirty-six cases while he was inspecting otherwise the gold cases would have been twice the weight of those that contained the baser metal for lead is proverbially heavy but under scientific tests is to gold as five to twelve or thereabouts in his secret and mysterious labour wiley was often interrupted whenever he heard a step on the pavement outside he drew the slide of his lantern and hid the light if he had examined the iron shutters he would have seen that his light could never pierce through them into the street but he was not aware of this notwithstanding these occasional interruptions he worked so hard and continuously that the perspiration poured down him ere he had unscrewed those eighteen chests containing the pigs of lead however it was done at last and then he refreshed himself with a draught from his flask the next thing was he took the three pigs of lead out of one of the cases marked shannon etc and numbered fifteen and laid them very gently on the floor then he transferred to that empty case the mixed contents of a case branded proserpine one etc and this he did with the utmost care and nicety lest gold dust spilled should tell tales and so he went on and amused himself by shifting the contents of the whole eighteen cases marked proserpine etc into eighteen cases marked shannon etc and refilling them with the shannon's lead frolicsome mr wiley then he sat down on one of the cases proserpinied and ate a biscuit and drank a little rum not much for at this part of his career he was a very sober man though he could feign drunkenness or indeed anything else the gold was all at his mercy yet he did not pocket an ounce of it not even a penny weight to make a wedding ring for nancy roos mr wiley had a conscience and a very original one it was and above all he was very true to those he worked with he carefully locked the gold cases up again and resumed the screwdriver for there was another heavy stroke of work to be done and he went at it like a man he carefully screwed down again one after another all those eighteen cases marked shannon which he had filled with gold dust and then heating a sailor's needle red-hot over his burning wick he put his own secret marks on those eighteen cases marks that no one but his own could detect by this time though a very powerful man he felt much exhausted and would gladly have snatched an hour's repose but consulting his watch by the light of his lantern he found the sun had just risen he retired to his place of concealment in the same cat-like way he had come out of it that is to say he mounted on the high cases and then slipped down behind them into the angle of the wall as soon as the office opened two sailors whom he had carefully instructed overnight came with a boat for the cases the warehouse was opened in consequence but they were informed that wiley must be present at the delivery oh he won't be long said they told us he would meet us here there was a considerable delay and a good deal of talking and presently wiley was at their back and put in his word seaton was greatly surprised at finding him there and asked him where he had sprung from me said wiley jocosely why i hailed from davy jones locker last i never heard you come in said seaton thoughtfully well sir replied wiley civilly a man does learn to go like a cat on board ship that is the truth i came in at the door like my betters but i thought i heard you mention my name so i made no noise well here i am anyway and jack how many trips can we take these thundering chests in let us see eighteen for the proserpine and forty for the shannon is that correct sir perfectly then if you will deliver them i'll check the delivery aboard the lighter there and then we'll tow her alongside the ships seaton called up two more clerks and sent one to the boat and one on board the barge the barge was within hail so the cases were checked as they passed out of the store and checked again at the small boat and also on board the lighter when they were all cleared out wiley gave seaton his receipt for them and having a steam tug in attendance towed the lighter alongside the shannon first seaton carried the receipt to his employer but sir 
said he is this regular for an officer of the proserpine to take the shannon's cargo from us no it is not regular said the old gentleman and he looked through a window and summoned mr hartcastle hartcastle explained that the proserpine shipped the gold which was the more valuable consignment and that he saw no harm in the officer who was so highly trusted by the merchant on this and on former occasions taking out a few tons of lead and copper to the shannon well sir said seaton suppose i was to go out and see the chest stowed in those vessels i think you are making a fuss about nothing said hartcastle mr white was of the same opinion but being too wise to check zeal and caution told seaton he might go for his own satisfaction seaton with some difficulty got a little boat and pulled across the harbour he found the shannon had shipped all the chests marked with her name and the captain and mate of the proserpine were beginning to ship theirs he paddled under the proserpine's stern captain hudson a rough salt sang out and asked him roughly what he wanted there oh it is all right said the mate he is come for your receipt and hewitt's be smart now men two on board sixteen to come seaton saw the chests marked proserpine stowed in the proserpine and went ashore with captain hewitt's receipt for forty cases on board the shannon and captain hudson's of eighteen on board the proserpine as he landed he met lloyd's agent and told him what a valuable freight he had just shipped that gentleman merely remarked that both ships were underwritten in sydney by the owners but the freight was insured in london no doubt there was still something about this business seaton did not quite like perhaps it was in the haste of the shipments or in the manner of the mate at all events it was too slight and subtle to be communicated to others with any hope of convincing them and moreover seaton could not but own to himself that he hated wardlaw and was perhaps no fair judge of his acts and even of the acts of his servants and soon a blow fell that drove the matter out of his head and his heart miss helen rolleston called at the office and standing within a few feet of him handed hardcastle a letter from arthur wardlaw directing that the lady's cabin on board the shannon should be placed at her disposal hardcastle bowed low to beauty and station and promised her the best possible accommodation on board the shannon bound for england next week as she retired she cast one quiet glance round the office in search of seaton's beard but he had reduced its admired luxuriance and trimmed it to a narrow mercantile point she did not know his other features from adam and little thought that the young man bent double over his paper was her preserver and protege still less that he was at this moment cold as ice and quivering with misery from head to foot because her own lips had just told him she was going to england in the shannon heartbroken but still loving nobly seaton dragged himself down to the harbour and went slowly on board the shannon to secure miss rolleston every comfort then sick at heart as he was he made inquiries into the condition of the vessel which was to be trusted with so precious a freight and the old boatman who was rowing him hearing him make these inquiries told him he himself was always about and had noticed the shannon's pumps were going every blessed night seaton carried this intelligence directly to lloyd's agent he overhauled the ship and ordered her into the graving dock for repairs then seaton for white and company wrote to miss rolleston that the shannon was not seaworthy and could not sail for a month at least the lady simply acknowledged messrs white's communication and seaton breathed again wardlaw had made miss rolleston promise him faithfully to sail that month in his ship the shannon now she was a slave to her word and constant of purpose so when she found she could not sail in the shannon she called again on messrs white and took her passage in the proserpine the essential thing to her mind was to sail when she had promised and to go in a ship that belonged to her lover the proserpine was to sail in ten days seaton inquired into the state of the proserpine she was a good sound vessel and there was no excuse for detaining her then he wrestled long and hard with the selfish part of his great love instead of turning sullen he set himself to carry out helen rolleston's will he went on board the proserpine and chose her the best stern cabin 
general rolleston had ordered helen's cabin to be furnished and the agent had put in the usual things such as a standing bedstead with drawers beneath chest of drawers small table two chairs washstand looking-glass and swinging lamp but seaton made several visits to the ship and effected the following arrangements at his own cost he provided a neat cocoa mat for her cabin deck for comfort and foothold he unshipped the regular six-paned stern windows and put in a single pane plate glass he fitted venetian blinds and hung two little rose-coloured curtains to each of the windows all so arranged as to be easily removed in case it should be necessary to ship dead lights in heavy weather he glazed the door leading to her bathroom and quarter gallery with plate glass he provided a light easy chair slung and fitted with grommets to be hung on hooks screwed into the beams in the midship of the cabin on this helen could sit and read and so become insensible to the motion of the ship he fitted a small bookcase with a button which could be raised when a book might be wanted he fixed a strike bell in her maid's cabin communicating with two strikers in helen's cabin he selected books taking care that the voyages and travels were prosperous ones no seaman's recorder lifeboat journal or shipwrecks and disasters in the british navy her cabin was the after cabin on the starboard side was entered through the cuddy had a door communicating with the quarter gallery two stern windows and a dead eye on deck the maid's cabin was the port after cabin doors opened into cuddy and quarter gallery and a fine trouble miss rolleston had to get a maid to accompany her but at last a young woman offered to go with her for high wages demurely suppressing the fact that she had just married one of the sailors and would have gladly gone for nothing her name was jane holt and her husband's michael donovan in one of seaton's visits to the proserpine he detected the maid and the captain talking together and looking at him with unfriendly eyes scowling at him would hardly be too strong a word however he was in no state of mind to care much how two animals in blue jackets received his acts of self-martyrdom he was there to do the last kind offices of despairing love for the angel that had crossed his dark path and illumined it for a moment to leave it now for ever at last the fatal evening came her last in sydney then seaton's fortitude sustained no longer by the feverish stimulus of doing kindly acts for her began to give way and he desponded deeply at nine in the evening he crept upon general rolleston's lawn where he had first seen her he sat down in sullen despair upon the very spot then he came nearer the house there was a lamp in the dining-room he looked in and saw her she was seated at her father's knee looking up at him fondly her hand was in his the tears were in their eyes she had no mother he no son they loved one another devotedly this their tender gesture and their sad silence spoke volumes to any one that had known sorrow poor seaton sat down on the dewy grass outside and wept because she was weeping her father sent her to bed early seaton watched as he had often done before till her light went out and then he flung himself on the wet grass and stared at the sky in utter misery the mind is often clearest in the middle of the night and all of a sudden he saw as if written on the sky that she was going to england expressly to marry arthur wardlaw at this revelation he started up stung with hate as well as love and his tortured mind rebelled furiously he repeated his vow that this should never be and soon a scheme came into his head to prevent it but it was a project so wild and dangerous that even as his heated brain hatched it his cooler judgment said fly madman fly or this love will destroy you he listened to the voice of reason and in another minute he was out of the premises he fluttered to his lodgings when he got there he could not go in he turned and fluttered about the streets not knowing or caring whither his mind was in a whirl and what with his bodily fever and his boiling heart passion began to overpower reason that had held out so gallantly till now he found himself at the harbour staring with wild and bloodshot eyes at the proserpine he who an hour ago had seen that he had but one thing to do to try and forget young wardlaw's bride he groaned aloud and ran wildly back into the town 
he hurried up and down one narrow street raging inwardly like some wild beast in its den by and by his mood changed and he hung round a lamp-post and fell to moaning and lamenting his hard fate and hers a policeman came up took him for a maudlin drunkard and half advised half admonished him to go home at that he gave a sort of fierce despairing snarl and ran into the next street to be alone in this street he found a shop open and lighted though it was but five o'clock in the morning it was a barber's whose customers were working people hair-cutting sixpence easy shaving threepence hot coffee fourpence the cup seaton's eye fell upon this shop he looked at it fixedly a moment from the opposite side of the way and then hurried on he turned suddenly and came back he crossed the road and entered the shop the barber was leaning over the stove removing a can of boiling water from the fire to the hob he turned at the sound of seaton's step and revealed an ugly countenance rendered sinister by a squint seaton dropped into a chair and said i want my beard taken off the man looked at him if it could be called looking at him and said dryly oh do you how much am i to have for that job you know your own charge of course i do three pence a chin very well be quick then stop a bit that is my charge to working folk i must have something more off you very well man i'll pay you double my price to you is ten shillings why what is that for asked seaton in some alarm he thought in his confusion the man must have read his heart i'll tell you why said the squinting barber no i won't i'll show you he brought a small mirror and suddenly clapped it before seaton's eyes seaton started at his own image wild ghastly and the eyes so bloodshot the barber chuckled this start was an extorted compliment to his own sagacity now wasn't i right said he did i ought to take the beard off such a mug as that for less than ten shillings i see groaned seaton you think i have committed some crime one man sees me weeping with misery he calls me a drunkard another sees me pale with the anguish of my breaking heart he calls me a felon may god's curse light on him and you and all mankind all right said the squinting barber apathetically my price is ten bob whether or no seaton felt in his pockets i have not got the money about me said he oh i'm not particular leave your watch seaton handed the squinting vampire his watch without another word and let his head fall upon his breast the barber cut his beard close with the scissors and made trivial remarks from time to time but received no reply at last extortion having put him in a good humour he said don't be so downhearted my lad you are not the first that has got into trouble and had to change faces seaton vouchsafed no reply the barber shaped him clean and was astonished at the change and congratulated him nobody will ever know you said he and i'll tell you why your mouth it is inclined to turn up a little now a moustache it bends down and that alters such a mouth as yours entirely but i'll tell you what taking off this beard shows me something you are a gentleman make it a sovereign sir seaton staggered out of the place without a word sulky eh muttered the barber he gathered up some of the long hair he had cut off seaton's chin with his scissors admired it and put it away in paper while thus employed a regular customer looked in for his cup of coffee it was the policeman who had taken seaton for a convivial soul End of chapters five and six